going to try to. Okay. All right. I think it's working. Okay. Um, well, shall, shall I uh, keep going on? Okay. Um, <clears throat> so, Myers, you know, our, our artistic career is, is really long and varied uh, by mid century, the point at which he's producing works like the, the, the oil paintings you see here. Uh, he really identifies principally as, as a painter, but uh, as I mentioned before, works really in a, in a variety of, uh, uh, of media uh, throughout his, his life. In art history surveys, he's principally associated with the um, with the work that he, he produced at the Bauhaus. And uh, let's see, I think we have to bring the program back up. Okay, there we go. Uh, uh, we'll get this wrong. <clears throat> um, so, wait, wait, Bauhaus. Principally, Herbert Beyer is associated with this work. Mm as a, a printer and typography uh, at this uh, famed school of art and design in, in, in Germany. Uh, and I think there are good reasons that that's been the, the, the kind of principal uh, association, even though his, I think, career deserves to be uh, um, better understood. Uh, the Bauhaus had a really outsized impact on 20th century art and culture, uh, despite having existed for only a total of 14 years. Um, the lifespan of the school was basically coterminous with uh, the Weimar Republic. That school came into existence uh, just after the First World War in, in 1919. And when the Nazis came to power in 1933, they shut the school down. But during that 14 year period, um, uh, an enormous amount of, of really influential artists uh, taught there, studied there, and uh, then took the uh, ideas uh, uh, globally where they've, they've had an enormous impact. And for Bayer, the episode was even shorter. He studied there uh, at the school's first location in Weimar uh, from 21 to 24. And then he taught at the school's second location in Dessau from 25 to 28, during which time he ran the school's uh, uh, printing workshop. And the works I'm showing here are typical of uh, the style of work that um, he, he, he produced in overseeing the, uh, uh, the, the workshop. Um, there's a 20 year gap between Bayer's departure from the Bauhaus and his work on the Atlas, but the lessons that he took from his time at the Bauhaus can still be seen in the Atlas's overall design and concept. And I'll, I'll just quickly point out two aspects of the design where I think this Bauhaus legacy is, is especially evident. Um, from a stylistic vantage point, there's the book's approach to layout uh, and typographic design. It uses many of the features that came to be associated with the, the Bauhaus during uh, Byers tenure. And these include this kind of asymmetrical page layout, um, the incorporation of bold, flat, solidly colored geometric shapes, these uh, blank white areas of the page that are, are used as kind of active elements in, in the design and exclusive use of, of sans serif type. And I think the really dynamic character of these uh, layouts uh, becomes really apparent when compared with some of the uh, commercial reference works of the, the same period. And uh, here I'm, I'm showing on the, the right uh, a page from uh, uh, Rand McNally's uh, 1949 Cosmopolitan World Atlas. And I think this is an absolutely beautiful uh, um, uh, illustration. And at, at the time, uh, th this book, uh, you know, won a bunch of awards and, you know, Rand McNally touted it as uh, kind of the cutting edge of um, Atlas design. Uh, but I think there are ways in which uh, we can see Bayer doing certain things that really come out of uh, his, his Bauhaus training and uh, that are typical of the artists and designers that uh, were, were working in interwar Europe, in particular thinking about the two page spread as a kind of single unit uh, rather than thinking about the pages separately and 
we can see how in Bayer's solar system spread, uh, he basically takes what in the cosmopolitan world atlas on, on the right is that little box at the, at the top, kind of tilts it on the side 90 degrees and then expands uh, the whole circumference of the sun, uh, uh, the, sun the disk of the sun onto that uh, uh, adjacent uh, page. Uh, and, and so the kind of I think, the almost cinematic drama that these uh, pages have are, are really uh, uh, striking. Beyond its stylistic appearance, uh, there's the book Thematic Emphases. Um, Byers' title page lists these overlapping fields, uh, geography, geology, demography, astronomy, climatology, economics. Um, you know, one of the, the most obvious methodological models for this would be uh, a good school atlas, which uh, was an enormous influence on, on uh, Herbert Byer. Um, but I would argue that he was also kind of re receptive to Good's um, methodology uh, because of his Bauhaus training and the educational philosophy advanced by the architect Walter Gropius, the founder and director of the Bauhaus. And Gropius's philosophy was rooted in this conviction, again, typical for the interwar generation, that the arts could integrate disparate fields uh, and, and disparate facets of life into a unified whole uh, with human beings at its at its center. Byer's uh, chosen subtitle for the atlas, uh, "Composite and Managed Environment," uh, is also I think indebted to this core Bauhaus vision. Um, meanwhile, the, the diagram that Byer designed for the atlas's uh, uh, title page, symbolizing the book's cross disciplinary character, bears some similarity uh, to Walter Gropius's famous 1923 diagram visual, visualizing the Bauhaus uh, curriculum. Uh, basically, students started with a kind of universal uh, uh, foundational design course and then became ever more specialized, but because they started in that outer ring, all kind of learning the same basic abstract concepts, when it came to combining their different disciplines together in a kind of total work of art, the idea was that they would all kind of speak the same language. Uh, they would have this kind of common uh, uh, currency. And, and uh, we can see, uh, I think, a, a similar example in a, a later diagram that uh, uh, Gropius published in, in an article in 1938. And, and Bayer was, was you know, very familiar with, with all of these uh, 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 diagrams uh, where Gropius promoted his kind of holistic and, and human-centered approach to arts education. Other aspects of uh, the Atlas's design stem from Bayer's later post-Bauhaus work of the, the 30s and 40s, um, showing a couple wartime uh, uh, posters and illustrations that uh, uh, Bayer produced and then kind of quoted uh, uh, later on in, in the atlas, which I'm, I'm showing the detail there. Um, as a freelance designer and art director, first in Berlin and later in New York, where he uh, immigrated in, in 1938, maps provided Bayer uh, with, with one of his principal uh, uh, devices in his toolkit. And um, of the commissions that he received during this period, one of the most remarkable and consequential for the atlas is surely his design for the Museum of Modern Arts 1943 Airways to Peace exhibition. Uh, the show's stated purpose as formulated by the exhibition's director, Monroe Wheeler, was to quote, assist the layman to orient himself in relation to the air age. Uh, it was also a work of political propaganda. Its core message that aviation had fundamentally transformed geographical relationships was also an argument against returning to isolationist policies after the end of the, the Second World War. Byer's best remembered display from this exhibition is so-called outside in globe, um, which you can see at the far left of that, that photograph, made uh, precisely this anti-isolationist point. We can see photographs of the interior, uh, by transposing the image of the Earth's exterior onto the viewer's interior surface, uh, viewers could both 
observe a greater part of the Earth's surface than you can usually see on a, a standard globe, and they can readily perceive the proximity of the northern hemisphere's uh, land masses. And so if, if North America's perceived distance from Europe and Asia provided uh, or had previously provided uh, justification for the isolationist uh, uh, position, this exhibition's reorientation achieved by contrasting uh, cylindrical projections with, with globes sought to counter this you know, outdated uh, uh, rationale behind isolationist arguments. Bayer's work on the exhibition proved to be formative in his own thinking about uh, geography uh, as well. Um, his studies from the period revealed the, the extent to which he'd come to view geography as something fluid and contingent, shaped by human knowledge and activities. And the, 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 the exhibition's educational component also served to sharpen Bayer's thinking about map literacy. That's the extent to which viewers recognize how map makers' decisions shape the stories that, that maps tell. And the question of how critical map reading skills can be taught became something of a preoccupation for Bayer uh, during his work on the show. And so by the time he receives the, the commission to design the World Geographic Atlas in 1947, he's fully committed himself to this educational project of imparting map reading skills to general audiences. Bayer's early preparatory drawings for the Atlas are telling in this regard, uh, with headings like Maps Can Lie, Bayer's first page designs foregrounded the roles that cartographers and designers play in making uh, geography. And in his final design, Bayer would reinforce this point with a format that supplanted, uh, supplemented the political topographic maps that had been provided by these uh, collaborating cartographic uh, uh, printers. Um, He'd combine them with explanatory charts and, and diagrams that he der derived from, from other sources or in some cases developed uh, uh, independently. And we can observe this strategy in, in pages that he, he designed uh, uh, to company Rand McNally's uh, U.S. state maps, um, where these graphic presentations illuminate topics that fall outside the scope of the, these full-page political maps. And so, uh, for example, we can see uh, detail here of the thematic map of Illinois, uh, which eliminates a lot of the uh, adjacent state maps, place names and roads in favor of a scheme that uses color and pictograms to visualize the distribution of different types of farming and industries across the state. So for instance, uh, dairy farming signified by that darker uh, uh, green predominates in the northeastern part of the, the state, uh, while Livestock and grains dominant in the, in the uh, central part of the state. And then we can see these little black pictograms, um, you know, that reveal that meat and steel and paper are concentrated in the area around Chicago and moving westward, uh, farm machinery becomes the, uh, the dominant industry. Um, by means of area diagrams and, and pictorial charts uh, in, in the space, you can see right below the Illinois um, uh, map, um, Bayer visualizes information in quantitative terms. And so, you know, we can see looking at this uh, uh, area diagram, uh, nearly two thirds of the, the, the state is classified as arable farmland, uh, uh, woodland uh, and pasture uh, comprise uh, about a fifth of the state's land. Uh, and we can look at the statistical charts. Uh, which reveal the total revenue generated by each of the various industries where each disc uh, signifies $20 million. Uh, and, and so um, one could see the kind of relative values between these, these industries. Um, the hog farming, uh, you could see that the top line in, in green, uh, you know, that, that constitutes um, uh, by far the, the, the largest uh, industry in the state, followed by corn and cattle. Um, but Bayer also provided historical context for all of this information. Uh, so we see the inclusion of a graph illustrating the effect of the invention of refrigeration on meatpacking centers, right? And we can see how after the invention of refrigeration, uh, the industry 
changes and, and you know, all of these, these different cities where the kind of uh, Chicago uh, uh, the, seem to be the greatest uh, benefits. Um, together with the map, if you look at the, the, the full spread on, on, on the left, um, you can see that at the very bottom, there's, there's a map showing the uh, uh, position of the continental ice shelf. Uh, and so we can really understand geography as a kind of process that's shaped by a confluence of innumerable natural and, and cultural uh, uh, factors. Now, it's important to note that Bayer didn't invent most of the presentation methods used in the Alps. Uh, he and his small team of um, assistants derived many of these charts and, and diagrams from, um, from sources. I'll just quickly mention a couple of the uh, uh, sort of pioneers of visual education who were, um, you know, really uh, uh, critical in this project. Um, Otto Neurath, uh, uh, this, this uh, Austrian social scientist working in Vienna in the 1920s, developed this method initially known as Vienna uh, um, the method of pictorial statistics. Later, it's called isotype. He uses these kind of countable uh, pictograms. Um, the cartographer, Erwin Rise, uh, who's known especially for his physiographical maps, um, uh, as well as his geological cross sections, is a continuous presence uh, uh, throughout the book. And J. Paul Good, uh, who's acclaimed school atlas, provided Bayer with this whole methodological model, props up throughout the, the, the World Geographic Atlas in the, the form of his distinctive. Uh, Homo Lozine projection and, and his thematic uh, uh, world maps. Um, but but Byers, I think, principal um, contribution rests in the synthesis of all of these disparate uh, material um, in the way that he modified existing presentations so that they'd work in uh, concert on the same page. Um, one instance of which I'm especially fond involves uh, this fusion of goods uh, temperature map, which I showed previously, you can see how uh, Bayer uh, in, in incorporates that. And these were supplied to him by, by Rand McNally, uh, but he marries goods map with this diagram that Erwin Reyes uh, uh, had uh, uh, from an illustration from, from his atlas, basically showing how vegetation grows at different altitudes and how that changes as uh, one travels northward uh, at these different uh, uh, latitudes. Uh, what Herbert Bayer does, and in most cases, there's a little attribution and he um, acknowledges that, uh, you know, the, the source uh, for, for these um, illustrations, though not in, in every instance. Uh, we can see Bayer extended uh, Rice's uh, illustration below the equator, uh, 60 degrees in the, the opposite direction, then rotates it uh, 90 degrees and fuses it with a uh, goods temperature map so that one can line up the latitude, um, you know, the parallels uh, along the side and, and um, you know, kind of compare um, and, and sort of read this in an even more kind of multivariate uh, uh, way. Um, but, you know, in, in, in other instances, uh, Bayer develops presentations that are really quite unlike anything else at, at the time. Uh, and his, his visualization of the, um, because the, the realm of the observable universe on the Atlas's uh, opening page spread. Um, for this, he, he develops a really ingenious solution for uh, um, picturing our solar system's place in the, the Milky Way galaxy and the extent of the universe that we might observe from this location. And so to show you a detail, um, you could see how Bayer used the crossing at the center of that figure eight form to indicate our position within the Milky Way. And he uses that reddish rectangle to highlight the galaxy's uh, disc-shaped plane. And then together with the, the pinch shape of the, the figure eight, uh, the rectangle also serves to, to indicate uh, the so-called zone of avoidance, This the parts of the universe that the dust within the plane of the Milky Way galaxy renders invisible to astronomers, or at least it, it did in 1953. Uh, and, and the figures, those, those dark blue ovoid uh, shapes represent the parts of the universe that are unobstructed by uh, galactic 
dosed. And so realizing that readers might not readily grasp this, this rather unusual visualization, Bayer makes a diagram of his diagram on the accompanying page. Um, and here we see this, this smaller, more schematic illustration, which explains the thinking behind his opening uh, uh, pages uh, image and, and summarizes its essential message saying that the region of space that we can observe from within our galaxy is not a sphere, but dumbbell shaped. And, and so I think it's in, in passages like, uh, like these where I think we can glimpse the Atlas's critical dimension. That's the, the way in which its design alerts readers to the artifice of scientific illustrations. These little meta illustrations serve to, to illuminate the designer's presence and the designer's choices and remind viewers that this is only one of many possible uh, solutions to, to visualizing information. And uh, uh, this, this illustration I'll add strikes me as, as an excellent analogy for thinking about the context of the Atlas's production uh, and, and how that context also shaped its design, foregrounding certain kinds of information while leaving potential blind spots. And it's, it's in this context that I'd like to turn now, since I think the story of the Atlas's creation explains some of its most distinctive uh, features. And to, to this uh, end, I want to shift our focus to the work's patron, Container Corporation of America, and uh, the company's founder and first president, Walter Paul Pepke. Uh, Pepke created Container Corporation in um, 1926 by merging what had been Chicago Mill and Lumber, a company he took over uh, from his father, with several other regional paper manufacturers. And Pepke's decision uh, to name this larger enterprise, Container Corporation of America, right, even though its operations hadn't yet really uh, expanded beyond the Midwest, um, I think reflected his ambitions for the company, but also his uh, understanding of the commercial and organizational function of corporate identity and corporate image. Uh, that's to say that Pepke realized that in addition to being uh, an important, you know, uh, important as a form of marketing, uh, equating the new company's identity with the geographic territory of the entire nation was also good for the company's internal functioning. Uh, the, the image would cultivate a sense of shared identification and loyalty uh, among its employees as the company started acquiring this vast and growing network of what had been previously separate and dispersed uh, operations. And so to assist them in creating this identity, uh, Pepke sought out the guidance of Egbert Jacobson, who we see here, uh, who worked as an art director at, at several prominent advertising agencies when Pepke hired him to redesign CCA's trademark in 1934. Um, the next year, Jacobson joined uh, the, uh, um, the company on a full-time basis and set up an in-house design department. And from this position, he implemented this comprehensive design program, which basically uh, en encompassed every part of the company's operation. So everything from its office and factory interiors to its trucks to its annual reports, um, Having an internal design department was already uh, unusual for an American business at, at this time, but uh, it was Container Corporation's forays into private publishing and artistic patronage that really set it apart from uh, other companies. To mark the company's 10th anniversary, um, and you'll all, I think, recognize this, this work as uh, it was the topic of a... Uh, uh, a lecture um, a year or two ago at the uh, here at the Chicago Map Society. Um, Jacobson oversaw the design of this privately published world atlas uh, to be distributed to the company's uh, customers. Um, this atlas reflected Jacobson's policy of total integration. Uh, Rand McNally provided maps and printed the volume as they would later do with, with Buyer's Atlas. The illustrations, as well as uh, photographs, uh, produced an entirely different work. And I don't have uh, images right here of photographs, but accompanying lots of the states where Container Corporation had mills and offices and different kinds of operations. Uh, this prominent architectural photographer, Torkel Torling, uh, Photo, created photographs that were, were incorporated around the, the, the state maps as, as, as well. Um, 
I think with this work, we we see really the first indications of the kind of cultural role that that Pepke and, and Jacobson imagined for uh, the company. And it became increasingly evident in the late 30s and early 40s as CCA launched a series of full page advertisements to run in, in widely read magazines, including Fortune and, and Time. Uh, for these ads, Jacobson commissioned artwork by internationally uh, acclaimed modernist artists, uh, many of them like Bayer and, uh, you know, or recently arrived European emigres. Um, and the company's unconventional approach to advertising came about in part as a reflection of the fact that advertising served a different function for Container Corporation than it did for other companies. Uh, CCA's customers were other companies. Its pro products reached the wider public only in this mediated form as packages bearing other companies' names and images. Um, at the same time, Container Corporation's interests were directly tied to its uh, public image. The company sought to attract investors and expand its market share. And so the promotion of this kind of modernist aesthetic uh, served both to grab the public's attention while linking Container Corporation in the public's imagination with this kind of forward-looking uh, and um, uh, you know, you know, imaginative, uh, expressive aesthetic. Um, during the war, references to the company and, and its products uh, kind of retreated to the periphery. And with campaigns like the United, United Nations series, uh, which uh, Leo Leone's ad in, in the middle comes from, uh, or later on the United States series, which John Atherton's ad comes from. Um, the advertisements increasingly give the impression that the company is simply sponsoring kind of public service announcements, promoting the values of liberal democracy, freedom of expression, uh, and you know, explaining the aims of the company's cultural patronage and the, the forward to the World Geographic Atlas. Pepke wrote the, the, the following statement. Quote, he said, uh, we in Container Corporation believe that a company may occasionally step outside its recognized field of operations in an effort to contribute modestly to the realms of education and good taste. And I think more so than its 1936 predecessor, uh, the World Geographic Atlas does appear to have the qualities of a kind of educational reference work with its information seemingly uninterrupted by company-specific material, the, the way the earlier uh, Atlas had been. But I think closer inspection also reveals the company's presence uh, in many of the details, uh, above all in the, the artwork that Bayer and his team borrowed directly from uh, CCA's advertisements. So for example, uh, John Atherton's illustration uh, for the United States series supplies the, the sunfish for the Minnesota page and the Balinese shadow figure from Leo Leone's United States series appears on the uh, in the Indonesia section. Uh, Miguel Covarrubias's drawings of the Easter Island monoliths uh, for CCA's wartime series they resurface in the Atlas's uh, uh, Pacific spread. Um, John Carlu's uh, sapling from a CCA advertisement promoting reforestation uh, provides a recurring symbol through throughout the atlas. And these details may seem minor, and I think mm, for audiences uh, today, they, they probably uh, go uh, unnoticed, but for a significant portion of the atlas's target audience, uh, they would have recognized the, the illustrations oblique references to the advertising campaigns, and the effect would have been really uh, cumulative. Um, the Atlas recipients had encountered company commissioned artworks over the preceding years, repeatedly in magazines, in company reports, in sales office, in, in, in public exhibitions. And in fact, uh, Herbert Beyer um, had played a key role in, in publicizing these, these advertisements, uh, first through an exhibition he designed um, initially um, at, at the Art Institute of Chicago and traveled to uh, dozens of cities over, over the, the coming years, um, but also through a bunch of articles he published in uh, design magazines that showcase these, these ads. To the extent that the Alice's maps also contain references to the company, this would have been less immediately obvious to uh, readers. Uh, yet, as Meyer's supplemental maps uh, demonstrate, Company interests did occasionally shape cartographic features uh, as well. 
Meyer and his team followed a policy in drafting these smaller maps, of which I'm showing a detail here from the Florida page. Um, they, they had a policy where they would exclude all place names except those of major population centers. Uh, but they made exceptions to include locations that were important to container corporation. Uh, so for instance, in this case, um, Fernandina, that little dot that you see right at the, the very northernmost part of, of the, the, the state, um, it only had a few thousand inhabitants, uh, but container corporation had significant operations there and they were opening a major new facility uh, in the following year. Similar considerations, uh, I think we're at work in the decision to devote a separate paragraph to Aspen on the Colorado page. Um, the text, which is cons conspicuously marked with buyers recently designed Aspen tourism trademark, praised the then still obscure mountain town as a year round resort with excellent skiing in the winter. Uh, to the extent that Aspen was on its way to becoming a year round resort, uh, it was largely due to the efforts of Pepti and, and Bayer, who had moved to Aspen in 46 and had worked over the course of the intervening years to develop and publicize the, uh, the destination as a, a major cultural and recreational center. Um, and, you know, interestingly, uh, the version of Rand McNally's Cosmopolitan World Atlas, which came out a few years after the World Geographic Atlas, uh, actually incorporates that bit of text and showcases Aspen, and and, and mm, it turns out that Andrew McNally III was a very close friend of Walter Pepke's, and he was one of the featured speakers at the very first uh, design conference in, in Aspen. Um, and so, <clears throat> seen in this context, many of the Atlas's features begin to read as a kind of calculated expression of the interests and priorities of the work's backers, designers, it's an intended readership. Uh, and we get a good sense of who this readership included when we look at the company's carefully considered list of, of recipients. Uh, they, and, and if you go to the Walter Pepke papers at University of Chicago, there's you know, hundreds of pages listing the names and addresses of everybody that they're sending uh, these, these, these atlases to. Uh, they they um, <clears throat> included attendees at, uh, uh, of the International Design Conference in, in Aspen. Uh, Pepke, Jacobson, and Bayer initiated this conference in 1951. This is the one that Andrew McNally uh, uh, spoke at. Um, this is also where Pepke gave the Atlas its first public presentation at the conference's third meeting in, in 1953. Uh, recipients also included uh, individuals and organizations with whom the, the um, Pepke and his company executives, you know, hope to cement or, or maintain positive relations. So. Container Corporation's customers, mostly executives at, at other companies, um, but also high-ranking government officials and lawmakers and, and places where CCA conducted business. Um, and then they also distributed the Atlas to academic institutions, research libraries, um, as well as stakeholders and, and participants in, in all of the different cultural initiatives that Pepke was uh, uh, spearheading. Um, The reactions to the Atlas, uh, which are also preserved in, in all of, you know, both the, the public reactions uh, in, in, in critics' reviews, but also all of the private correspondence um, are a really fascinating reading. Uh, you see people like uh, the, the industrial designer, Walter Dorman Teague, who's comparing uh, Pepke and Container Corporation to the Medici in, in Florence, Italy. Um, you get the, the poet James Laughlin and, and publisher uh, who's expressing his hope that that container corporation is going to set an example for other companies to follow and I'll give you a nice quote here where he says this is exactly the sort of thing that great corporations should do more of if we are to develop into the kind of society which will spread the benefits without diminishing the incentive um, and so you can kind of get a sense of the lens through which audiences were, were interpreting this uh, uh, Atlas. The geographer Shannon McCune, who was then a, a, a Fulbright fellow at um, Tokyo University, he saw the Atlas as a testament to the inherent superiority of free market capitalism 
He says, this type of publication is the strongest possible refutation of the supposed evils of the American capitalist system, the normal communist line talk. It serves as evidence that under the American free enterprise system, organizations like Container Corporation can and do prepare material for general educational value. Um, and so, you know, these reactions are, are valuable, I think, not only because they give us a, a, a sort of lens into how readers understood uh, the Atlas at the time, but they also highlight, I think, some of the tensions that Bayer was trying to navigate and, and resolve as he was uh, uh, designing the Atlas. And in fact, he made a point of emphasizing in his preface to the Atlas that this was really apolitical in character. He says, political references have been avoided wherever possible because increasing independence of all peoples compels us more than ever to consider the world as one. And he, he said he wanted to advance what he described as a global concept of the earth. And he wanted the Atlas to prioritize what he described as the physical and material background against which mankind is set. Um, and yet, despite his aspirations to steer the book uh, away from uh, uh, political expressions, I, I think there are places where ideology breaks through. Um, oh, we got to show these images. This is uh, Walter Pepke and Jacobson at that first uh, meeting in, in, in Aspen. And uh, the next year, we see Bayer with uh, Buckminster Fuller, whose work was uh, uh, also featured in, in, in the Atlas. One of the particularly stunning pages towards the end uh, incorporates uh, Buckminster Fuller's work. Uh, you know, all of the people who attended these, the, the, the conference, uh, you know, received copies of the Atlas, and it's really kind of wonderful to read their personal notes. Uh, Buckminster Fuller told Bayer that um, Bayer's redesign of, of Fuller's own work was much better than uh, in Fuller's initial uh, uh, version. Um, in, in Bayer's narrative, the United States is featured as this kind of beacon of freedom, leading history's forward march to this globally integrated society and economy and, and providing a democratic alternative to that opposing model of, of human advancement, uh, the Soviet Union. Um, and in the comparative presentations of the United States and Soviet Union, uh, access to natural resources really emerges as the factor uh, that is most likely to determine the outcome of, of the struggle between these uh, two, two models. So we get a lot of these um, uh, images that, that compare area and access to, to different natural resources. Um, and this is pretty much the lens uh, through which uh, Europe is, is discussed uh, uh, generally. Um, in this case, the, um, uh, in the coverage of Central Europe, you can see there's this um, page uh, this, this map at the, the right of the page, ostensibly showing the um, uh, pre-war ethnic composition of Czechoslovakia, but it also notes the locations of coal and petroleum and other industries. And it laments that uh, the post-war boundary lines have been drawn in such a way that it, it gives Soviet forces access to oil wells in Eastern Austria and to uh, coal districts in Poland that had once been German and uh, that all of these things are to the benefit of the, the Soviet Union. And Bayer underscores these points in a second map at the, the pages lower right, uh, depicting the Soviet Union's westward expansion since 1938 with these red rays fanning out from uh, Moscow across the Eastern Bloc countries and this hammer and sickle boldly marking the, the Russian capital's location at the margin. But the Atlas also diverged from prevailing, uh, prevailing Cold War narratives in certain key respects, uh, above all in the, the central place that it gave to environmental conservation. And indeed, it was the depletion of the Earth's natural resources rather than nuclear annihilation that figured in the Atlas's account of uh, a looming threat of potentially catastrophic proportions. Um, and I'll just quote Bayer. Uh, he says, no problem confronting the world today is more vital than conservation and wise utilization of natural wealth. With the world population in increasing uh, in alarming numbers, uh, withdrawals from nature's storehouse are multiplying at a tremendous rate. And, and Bayer drove home the urgency uh, of this crisis and the, this strikingly austere design for the Atlas's final page 
uh, where two presentations displayed uh, the relationships between population numbers and natural resources. And the uh, top presentation, this, this area diagram, visualizes the gap between acres of land sensibly needed to feed and clothe one person adequately and the average number of acres available to the world's then estimated 2.35 billion inhabitants. Um, I think today, uh, my understanding is that uh, um, scientists take a somewhat uh, different, um, uh, you know, have somewhat different perspective on 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 this uh, this idea of a fixed amount of land that's that's needed uh, to sustain a population. But um, in any event, the, the second presentation in the space beneath uh, indicates that this deficit is only likely to go as population increases. He estimates that. By year uh, 2000, there will be thrill, 3 billion people on the planet. Of course, we passed 6 billion uh, in, in uh, the year 2000, so it was really a conservative uh, uh, estimate. Um, but by your decision to conclude the Atlas with this presentation that visualizes the deficit as a kind of common fate, as though it would be shared evenly by the entire world's population, made a visual argument uh, for the necessity of a kind of global and collective uh, response. Um, and Bayer gives a whole bunch of recommendations. Uh, many of them are rooted in kind of New Deal era conservation uh, programs, uh, you know, about measures that could be taken, land reclamation through irrigation and drainage, reforestation, improvements in, in production and processing of raw materials. Uh, but given that there are limited precedents for any kind of international coordination on environmental policy. Bayer also includes in his list of recommended measures, um, quote, the exchange of knowledge between countries and worldwide education programs. And through its very design, I think the World Geographic Atlas makes a persuasive case for the, the role that communication might play in uh, these kinds of educational uh, initiatives. Um, and so I'll, wrap up just by uh, returning to the, the the questions that I think animated Bayer's vision for the, the, the Atlas, which is, you know, how can critical map reading skills be taught? How can readers learn to recognize the parts that map makers and designers play in the formation of geographical knowledge? Um, the World Geographic Atlas, I would argue, remains a compelling model for teaching these interpretive skills, even if in some instances it, it demonstrates how easily the boundaries between informing and persuading can, can be blurred. Uh, I'd also venture that Bayer's graphic approach, by virtue of what he describes as his composite method and its often sort of self-conscious character, reminds us as, as readers to be alert to the artifice of representation, right? To the ways in which blind spots and distortions are frequently embedded uh, in the very structures of uh, our representational strategies. And in this respect, uh, the Atlas also serves as a provocation. And, and I think among its most valuable contributions, maybe the challenge that it puts to its readers, which is to consider how the position from which we observe the universe shapes our understanding of it. So thank you. We do have some time for uh, a couple of questions. Uh, I'm also going to see if uh, we, have, we have quite a few questions in the uh, push, uh, online as well. And I'll see if I can pull these up. Any questions from the audience? Well, it seems like Pepe is more explicit about the use of humanities in his company's efforts to observation. Uh, I think um, Pepe's interests were maybe more wide ranging in terms of. Um, Cultivating and trying to build education programs was really involved with the Books Foundation. Uh, and he did believe that um, business 
as this kind of social responsibility or at least an opportunity uh, that we can take advantage of to try to um, you know, cultivate honoring uh, you know, standards and, and art appreciation. Uh, he also never lost sight of what it would cost and how it would potentially benefit the uh, uh, the, the company. And so I think there, there was always a very kind of uh, pragmatic approach uh, in, in, in that, that, that kept teaching. I think in Bayer's case, um, at least the way he talks about his uh, work, it's, it's very much about the the idea. He, you know, in fact, much to Pepsi's chagrin, uh, he goes and collaborates with the Italian publisher to create another version of the Atlas, which Pepsi felt diluted uh, the container corporation brand. Uh, that the whole idea was that it was this exclusive Atlas, and Pepsi was turning down all of the publishers that were, you know, asking whether. They might reissue it as a book on the market. Um, and, you know, buyer, uh, you know, wanted to reach as many people as possible and wasn't that concerned about the, the works, um, the way it, it might uh, function as the, the equivalent of the So, you know, I think they're both. Um, Kind of contradictory figures in 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 the opposite side. I have a question from from the ether. Uh, it's from Matthew Edney, um, and I think uh, I I remind you that the. Unfortunately, the people in the ether didn't get the first 15 minutes or so of the audio. So he says, Bear's Atlas uses what I always think of as a pastel palette common to atlases and color books in the 1950s and 1960s. Is this connected to Bauhaus Art Deco or is this a function of changes in printing technology or what? And I, of course, you mentioned his connection to Bauhaus and Matthew undoubtedly saw the illustrations of that connection. But this whole issue of color is is another. If you can answer the question closer to the computer, sure, sure. Um, my sense is that the palette is more rooted in recent illustration in Fortune magazine, particularly the kinds of. I mean, Bayer did a number of illustrations for for Fortune, uh, but uh, the art directors at, at Fortune, um, uh, Will Burton and Leo Leone. Um, they kind of cultivate a, a, a style that uh, I think buyer's palette for the Atlas really draws on. And I think it is much softer than what you see at the Bauhaus. The Bauhaus was much more austere. It was mostly this kind of constructivist white, red, black, and, and you know, that was that, um, uh, at least as far as the uh, um, a lot of the typographic material, um, you know, certainly uh, painting at, at, at the Bauhaus was, you know, kind of richer and uh, in its path. Is there any evidence that the Bauhaus was more It's Richard E. Terrace and mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, so I'll just repeat the question in case they didn't hear it. Is there any evidence of collaboration with a number of people that he uh, borrowed from? Uh, Dennis mentioned particularly Richard Eads Harrison, mm -hmm. Rowan Rice, and Buckminster Fuller. Uh, yeah, yeah, that's a, a great question, and it's a complicated one with many different answers depending on which collaborator or potential collaborator you're talking about. Uh, with uh, um, Rise, he's pretty much mm, just given permission to reproduce the the works from uh, uh, the different atlases that, that 
Price worked on. And so I don't think there was much communication uh, there. I think the work just sort of reappeared with Rise's permission or at least his publisher's permission in the, the, the atlas. And then in some cases where Bayer didn't think that weren't quite, that the illustrative style didn't you know match, he, he redesigned it, but I don't think there was much discussion uh, whereas with um, other designers, Buckminster Fuller, there was more of a um, a discussion. I know with with Harrison, he had collaborated on the Airways to Peace ex exhibition. Uh, to some extent, I think by the time he's working on the the Atlas in '53, he sort of leaves behind those kind of perspectival uh, views. Uh, that that Harrison is so famous for. Uh, it's much a much sort of flatter, more diagrammatic uh, type of of map. Um, but certainly, Harrison was really uh, 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 formative. And I think you know, if you were going to mm, criticize mm, Bayer uh, for one thing, it's maybe not. Uh, mm, I don't know, acknowledging the extent to which. Uh, some of these, you know, other people really shaped his, his uh, uh, thinking. Um, J. Paul Good certainly gets uh, a lot of acknowledgement uh, in the case of Otto Neurath, the um, uh, social scientist who developed or was one of the main um, pioneers of pictorial statistics. You know, there's like one sort of brief acknowledgement uh, in, in the, the Atlas and Neurath died in, in 1945, but his widow, who was still very active in, in developing uh, uh, this work was, was upset that there was not more kind of acknowledgement of, of the role that it played. And so I think there, there was definitely a lot of um, egos that were probably driving uh, 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 some of this. As far as collaboration though, this particular page is a really interesting instance. He collaborates with uh, an astronomer uh, based at the High Altitude Observatory in, in uh, uh, Climax, Colorado, uh, who's a, um, also a professor at, at, at Boulder. Uh, and they had a correspondence over several months where, uh, you know, Bayer was bringing sketches up to his office and the, uh, uh, Roberts was giving him uh, uh, feedback and, uh, um, you know, following up with uh, uh, letters saying, you know, no, you may not want to pursue, uh, you know, that hypothesis that's kind of outdated at this point. Whatever. And so there were really kind of fruitful collaborations, I think, with people who were kind of clearly in other professional lanes. Uh, I think when it came to other designers, there was a little bit more kind of caginess. One last question from the floor. How many people were on the team that worked with Bayer? Yeah, so uh, there were three assistants uh, at its biggest, uh, three graphic designer assistants, and then mm, Bayer's wife, Joella Bayer, um, did an enormous amount of the, the work and is kind of credited in the preface as, you know, doing like the proofreading, but when you see the letters, she's kind of like the project manager, and she's coordinating between the studio in Aspen and Ray McNally in Chicago and the, you know, buyer is overseeing the printing in Italy and she's reporting back to him and, you know, kind of keeping the assistants in the studio on task. And so, uh, but it was a very small operation there in, in Aspen and uh, it was really kind of scrappy and, and intense. And then, you know, there were a few people at Rand McNally uh, who were uh, kind of working on this alongside other projects that we're working on. And then you had uh, the art director, Ed Jacobson, at uh, the, the Chicago Office of Standard Corporation. So probably maybe about 10 people ultimately at any time that were kind of working on the project. But it was about four to five years altogether from beginning to end. Thank you. Fascinating. Uh, thank you all for braving the weather uh, tonight. And those of you who stayed on through the first pass, the first 15 minutes, when it was a largely mute uh, presentation, thank you for staying 
for sticking with it. And uh, we keep hoping that each month we're going to get better at this. Uh, stay tuned. Stay with us. Uh, we'll, we'll get these bugs worked out. Thank you again all and enjoy your evening. I have not. Remember, um, this is a guy who often recommended this. Why they were working with the young boy.